Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas, and our ongoing study in Corinthians by Paul, dated around A.D. 56. We're going to take a look at the center point lesson in the letter to the Corinthians. The center point verse is chapter 8, verse 6. We're going to take a look at the critical, pivotal center point lesson for Paul's Christian ethics. So before we get going, let's go to column four and take a look at the very top of column four. I've got the Shema prayer in Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. That was the Shema prayer that was prayed by the, the Jews in Paul's day. Paul rewrote this Shema prayer in 1 Corinthians 8.6. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. All of Paul's ethics hinges on this verse of 8.6. The entirety of Paul's ethics hinges on the rewritten Shema prayer of 1 Corinthians 8.6. So we're going to build up to that, but we're going to start by looking at block one first. We're going to look at uh, the need to affirm spiritual thoughtfulness. Paul goes on to say that uh, the unmarried man is thoughtful concerning the things of the Lord and how he might please the Lord. So a celibate unmarried man will concentrate on the things of the Lord. And then in verse 33, he says, but the married man is more concerned about the world and how he should please his wife. And then he goes on in 34 and he says, there are additional divisions between the unmarried woman who will care about the things of the Lord and the married woman who cares for the things of the world and for pleasing her husband. So Paul says celibacy serves devotion to the Lord, and it is not everyone's gift, but he says, if it is your gift, it will help you serve the Lord in, more, in a more total way. But the key moment in every lesson is always the second moment. So block two is going to be critical because Paul rewrite, rewrites the Shema prayer because of his concept of spiritual attentiveness or the um, attentive lordship of Christ causes him to rewrite the Shema. He begins in verse 35, and he said that, uh, I write these things to you, I write these lessons to you so that you might be honorable and you might be attentive toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, I... Uh, you should negate inappropriate sexual behavior. If you're going to have no control over your sex drive, it's better to marry. And then in verse 37, he says that uh, celibacy is for the person who can stand firm in that conviction. They are, don't fall prey to sexual compulsions, and they have power over their own will and their own sexual drive. And they have framed this conviction in their own heart. Only if they can meet that criteria would they be able to take up the gift of celibacy, which Paul did take up. But he says that uh, if you can do so, then uh, it will increase your spiritual attentiveness to the Lord. But you must have that ethical conviction of the heart and the strength to bring that conviction forward in a concrete way before you take up celibacy. So he approves it, but he does not demand it. He uh, encourages it if you have that gift, if you have that ability. Now in block three, Paul goes on and he says that uh, if a man gives his uh, daughter in marriage, he does well to do so, but uh, 
It's also uh, important that a wife remain bound to her husband for as long as he lives. But if a husband dies, then a widow is free to remarry whomever she so chooses. But then again, Paul says, however, it's more blessed to remain single and celibate. Again, he puts his opinion out there that celibacy is the preferred choice if you can do it. And he says, and I do believe that this is the teaching from God's Spirit, that it is preferential to take up celibacy if you have that gift. If you have that gift, you'll be in a more blessed state for making that choice. But it is very much about uh, having that uh, power over your sexual impulse that would truly be a gift of the Spirit for only certain individuals. So Paul says that it, he does take a very strong stance against sexual inappropriate action. He is against pornography. He is against inappropriate sexual acts. He says it's better to remain celibate if you have that spiritual gift. And uh, all of it comes down to the fact that uh, we are free in Christ to affirm the attentive lordship of Christ. That's key to, to Paul, this concept of attentive lordship. And that leads him to rewrite the Shema prayer. We're going to take a look at that now in column four. Now in column four, the Shema prayer was in Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. In Rome, and at 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Paul wrote, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. We'll pick up with 8.3. Paul says, if anyone loves God, he is known by God and continues to be known by God. And then in verse 8.4 he says, now concerning your question about meat offered to idols, we know that it amounts to absolutely no value in the world as far as uh, the point of view of, of Christ because there's only one true God. There's only one true God and one Lord, Jesus Christ. So meat offered to idols is not a legalistic uh, food law that needs to be taken up where uh, the Jews used to say you couldn't eat meat offered to idols. Paul says you got that freedom. You can do that. You can eat meat offered idols because there's nothing attached to it anymore because we are free in Christ to live as disciples of Christ, not under legalistic rules of the Sabbath or food laws, not anymore. But he goes on to say that uh, these gods, these pagan gods, are the so-called gods and there are many pagan gods. But then he concludes with a famous verse in 8.6. And he says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, out of whom are all things, and ourselves created unto him. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things created, and ourselves are also created through him. All of creation takes th has taken th place through Jesus Christ as the creative rhema voice of creation. But for Paul, all of new creation also takes place through Christ and his lordship. All of new creation is through Jesus Christ. And our new life in Christ, our new life, our new spiritual being is created through the lordship of Jesus Christ. So if we really wanted to think about uh, what kind of a triad we, are we looking at, it would be that uh, in Paul's ethics, he says that we should affirm spiritual thoughtfulness concerning the Lord. We should affirm the fact that Christ is spiritually attentive in his lordship at the right hand of the Father. And we should take on the position of celibacy if we are so gifted to do so. Only if we have that power and that spiritual gift, then we should voluntarily take up celibacy if we can. 
and then all of that leads to the ethical monotheism, which means that Paul rewrite, rewrites the Shema prayer. The Shema prayer was the prayer of monotheism. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, is rewritten to include Jesus Christ. But to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Paul finds Jesus Christ not attached to the Shema prayer, as N.T. Wright pointed out, but he finds Jesus Christ in the center of the Shema prayer. That was taught by N.T. Wright. That's where I learned it. And uh, he pointed out this verse is the rewritten Shema prayer, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. So I owe that teaching to N.T. Wright, but it's a powerful teaching and now I know how it took place. It took place through Paul's ethics. It was the ethical stance and his ethical doctrine that caused him to confront the attentive lordship of Christ. And the attentive lordship of Christ encouraged him and empowered him to rewrite the Shema prayer in chapter 8, verse 6. It's so beautiful, I want to read it again. Because... The entire 1 Corinthian letter pivots. This verse is in the exact center of the letter. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So again, it's a proclamation of monotheism, but it's also the proclamation that the Lord, the Lordship, of God is Jesus Christ Messiah. He is the living, exalted, resurrected Lord, reigning in lordship in the Uranus heaven at the right hand of the Father. Paul affirms this again, again, and again throughout all of Galatians, all of Thessalonians, all of Ephesians, all three missionary journeys, and now in Corinthians, where he gives birth to the first Christian ethics. His new ethical monotheism comes to the forefront in this lesson. That's your key verse. Eight, chapter 8, verse 6. Circle that, put it in brackets. That's the pivotal verse for the entire letter to the Corinthians. Paul's entire ethics is based on that one verse. His entire ethics is based on the attentive lordship of a reigning, exalted, resurrected, Jesus Christ Messiah, crucified for us, resurrected to inaugurate the apocalyptic age, and exalted into lordship as Kyrios Lord, which cancels out the Kyrios Lordship of the emperor cult of Rome, and Christ is Kyrios Lord. He is Christos Messiah. He is Kyrios, Lord. He is Krenos, Judge, over the living and the dead. For Paul, Jesus Christ is Christos, Kyrios, and Krenos. Christos, Kyrios, and Krenos. So we have beautiful, beautiful teaching here from Paul on an ethical monotheism that shattered his previous understanding of monotheism. It became deeply, deeply enriched through Jesus Christ, profoundly enriched because of the Damascus Road experience. That's going to wrap up this lesson, but we will have a recall triad next.